Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am joined by Anne Grady, who is just outside Austin in Texas. How are you doing, Anne? I'm doing great, John. Good to see you. Yeah, you too. And Anne is best-selling author, entrepreneur, two-time TEDx speaker, and has spent the last few decades working with Fortune 500 companies and associations and various other organizations to help teach resilience. And it's exciting, Anne just released a new book called Mind Over Moment, Harness the Power of Resilience, and a workbook journal to go with it. Yeah, which is fantastic. Um, well, and let's be honest, I mean, this year, let's face it, uh, the first time probably we've had a global experience, like a shared global experience like we have. It has really tested people's mettle in many different ways and more than others. So obviously, a book about resilience is is timely, to, to say the least. But just give me, give me a moment, the genesis of this book and why you wrote it and why you also did the accompanying journal with it. Well, I... I hadn't planned on a global pandemic when I started writing this book, but it turned out that that's what we got. And mm -hmm. so I questioned releasing a book in the middle of a pandemic, but I felt like the tools and the skills were needed now more than ever. You know, one of the things that I, I find fascinating, I, I really used to think that resilience was a genetic gift. Mm -hmm. kind of like skinny thighs. You either have it or you don't. Uh, but what I have learned is that resilience is a set of skills, habits, behaviors that you can cultivate and practice and hone. And whether we like it or not, life is giving us plenty of chances to practice. So I wrote the book because we have gotten really great at being busy. We deal mm -hmm. with stress all the time. We have stress management books and podcasts and seminars and and yet we're still obsessed with stress and we're still stressed out and we're busier than we've ever been. But what we tend to do is end up reacting our way through life and each day just becomes the same day. And if we are deliberate, we can step out of that reactivity and create a life that we truly deserve, one that we're excited about. Uh, and it happens in small, subtle, mindful choices throughout the day. So that's the goal of the book. And a special ed teacher, I was speaking to about 4,000 teachers, and one of the young women, Robin Headkey, came up to me at the book table when I was doing a signing, and she showed me notes that she had taken. She basically drew my entire keynote. She storyboarded wow. it, and it was so fantastic. I hadn't actually planned on releasing a journal with mm -hmm. it, but it was so incredible, and it really brought the concepts to life. So the companion journal is a way for you to put into practice all of the lessons that you learn in the book. That's fantastic. So yeah, uh, so as you say, people are busy or perceive themselves to be busy. I think they're more distracted, but that's just, uh, that's my opinion on it. Um, and obviously you got the pandemic and you've got all these other things going on. And yes, you're saying like there's all this stress management and stuff out there. There seems to be so much stuff that people probably get stressed trying to figure out which stress management tool to use. Exactly. Um, but you say, so the, the book is called Mind Over Moment, right? So just explain that concept of mind over moment. Well, I used to think uh, mindfulness was just this sitting in mm -hmm. a full lotus and finding your zen and eating tofu, and that didn't appeal mm -hmm. to me. I'm a, I'm a salesperson, I'm an entrepreneur, <laughs> I'm goal-oriented, I'm achievement-oriented, I'm about mm -hmm. as type A as type A gets. And, and so when everyone started saying, you need to practice mindfulness to manage the stress of my mm -hmm. special needs son who's autistic and mentally right. ill and going through a whole series of health challenges... And that never appealed to me. But my, my grandmother used to say, you know, honey, if enough people tell you you're tired, maybe it's time you lay down. Uh, right. She also used to say, if you act like an ass, don't be surprised if people try to ride you. But that, that's, a different <laughs> that's a different book. Uh, yeah. Mindful moment is demystifying mindfulness. Because mm -hmm. the, the truth about it is that mindfulness is nothing more than paying attention on purpose. It's brain training. And so right. you mentioned that we spend a lot of time distracted, and you're right, about half of the time we are thinking about something other than what we're doing right now. And mindfulness is a way to start. It, it's brain training. It's bringing your brain back to focusing on what's right now. And the reason that's so powerful 
is that as we age, our gray matter density depletes. And that's the part of your brain that's responsible for attention management, emotional regulation, focus. And you can reverse stress-related changes. And the goal of mindfulness is to continue to bring yourself back to where you are. So it's actually... You know, I thought I was failing meditation miserably, and that's a form mm -hmm. of mindfulness because my mind would wander. But sure. that actually means it's working. So it's just brain training. It's training your brain to observe your thoughts and emotions without getting carried away by them. So it's making mindful decisions in the moment to decide whether your habits, your behaviors are serving you or whether they might be sabotaging your resilience. Yeah, and I love that. I love that uh, phrase you used a few moments ago: paying attention on purpose, mm -hmm. uh, because I do think that that is such a powerful thing, and I do think that's where a lot of us fail today. Yeah. Is because you're right. There's so much stuff going on that being in the moment, focusing on what's in front of you, focusing on the uh, focusing on the other person you're going to say is like focusing actually on what your prospect might actually be saying, as opposed to what you think they're saying. Um, but all of this stuff is, it, 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 see, it seems like the, the culture, the pervasive culture and everything is so against this in many ways. I mean, the messages it sends like, oh, don't pay attention to anything. Everything is a soundbite or whatever. So retraining your brain is something that um, probably is not going to come that easy to some people. No, I've been in sales for 20 years. And you got to be careful when you're in sales, how mm -hmm. you explain it to your kids, because... Mm -hmm. I'm a, I'm a professional speaker. And so when my, my son was little and his teacher asked, what does your mom do? He said, well, she goes on stages and they pay her. Um, <laughs> so you gotta explain that to yeah. But sales really is about, I mean, the best salespeople, right? I mean, it's mm -hmm. all about listening. Can I understand your pain point? Can I understand your problem? Can I feed it back to you in a way that makes you go, that's exactly what I was thinking. And can I provide a solution, whether I'm that solution or not? And that's what builds cr trust and credibility um, and becoming a trusted advisor. And that only happens when you're present with people. You know, mm -hmm. I think 86% of smartphone users is the most recent statistic. 86% of smartphone users check their phone while they're talking with friends, family, and colleagues. Oh. So if you've ever been in a sales meeting where someone glances at their phone because a notification went off and they're like, oh, sorry, sorry to me to be distracted, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's become so commonplace that we're not even aware it's happening mm -hmm. and it's not going to get the results that we want. So we have to make mm -hmm. a choice. Is the way I'm thinking and behaving going to get me the results I want or Am I willing to, you know, shift the way I'm thinking and behaving to get a different result? And I, I you know, since COVID has started, we've done over 150 sessions for leaders wow. and organizations on resilience. And the reason we're able to offer that is because we listen, we pay attention to what people need. And that's really the key for great, great sales leadership. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And, and, and I love that. Yeah, now people do. Uh, I mean, I mean, it's come to the point where people don't even consider it rude now to pull out their phone in the middle of a convert in the middle of a sentence. Maybe you're saying something and they pull out their phone to look at it and go, oh, sorry, what was that again? And yeah. nobody and and they don't even seem to think that that's in the slightest bit um, in the slightest bit rude. And I would um, argue that politeness is not kindness. No, so there's a there's a big difference between being polite and being kind but you know I was talking about the sh the stress culture that we live in it's so counterintuitive but you know we're taught turn that frown upside down you have so much to be grateful for don't worry about you know the truth of the matter is when you try not to stress you stress more so instead of trying to stress less if you focus on generating positive emotions, like figuring out what brings you joy, makes you laugh, makes you feel grateful, allows you to be connected with people socially, whether that's through Zoom or in person, mm -hmm. um, doing good for others, all of those emotions cancel out the stress. So the, the goal isn't how do I stop stress? Stress is actually very positive. Your brain mm -hmm. needs it. It's how do I offset that by focusing on the right things so I can train my brain? Yeah, and you say in your you have a chapter like your relationship with stress, and I think that's that that's interesting what you just um, highlighted there because most people probably get the idea it's all about you've got to try and eliminate stress from your life, right? You're saying okay, you can't eliminate stress, and actually yeah. stress plays a role. So when you talk about your relationship with stress, what do you mean by that? 
Well, it, it, most of us, I think, and many of us, not most of us, I, for one, I know, got addicted to it. I got addicted mm -hmm. to stress and the absence of it almost didn't feel like things were normal. Like, what am I supposed to do when there's nothing to stress about? Well, you create things to stress about. But if you've ever gone on a diet and tried not to think about chocolate cake, right? All you think about is chocolate cake. And the reason for that is when you direct your attention somewhere that becomes your reality, we have selective yeah. attention. So when you tell your brain, stop stressing, all your brain hears is stress. And whether you realize it or not, you're creating more of it. So what is your relationship with stress means, are you living under stress on purpose? Are there things that you're mm -hmm. doing that are creating it for yourself? We, we self-impose a lot of this. But the truth is your brain doesn't know the difference between being excited or being stressed. The only difference is the story that we tell ourselves about it, mm -hmm. right? So it's starting to pay attention to what is this feeling physiologically, psychologically? Is it serving me? And it's if it's not, what do I need to change about the way I'm thinking or behaving to shift that relationship? You know, we, we get caught in relationships with people all the time and, and we know that they're not good for us. Well, we're in a relationship with stress and it's time we break up. Yeah, and it's, and it's fascinating um, you say that because uh, a lot of people then you get into this whole thing of, well, that's just me. Oh, you know, I just stress about everything or as if they have no control over it. Oh. And the question you always have to ask in that situation is just like what you said is, you know, what, what purpose is it serving for you? And it's like when you have toxic people or whatever in your life, instead of, instead of blaming them, you have to ask yourself, why do you feel the need to have them in your life? What yeah, role are they, the what, what, ro what uh, role are they fulfilling for you? Exactly. And it's, uh, you know, people will say, I don't know what to do. Everyone around me is negative and stressed out. Yeah, and yeah. You're the common denominator, right? <laughs> well, what are we doing to attract these people to us? And what are we doing to enable it to continue? Because it's easy to play the victim and just kind of end up where we're headed and wish we could have done things differently. But being mindful means you take back control of your life. You step out right. of reactivity and, and you're deliberate about the choices you make. Now, nobody can do that flawlessly. Even, even I can't. And I research it and teach it and speak mm -hmm. for a living. <laughs> it's deliberate choices, micro moments throughout the day that allow you to take back control. But it's one at a time. Yeah, and I love that you also said, I love you said that it's micro moments toward, throughout the course of the day and you do it, a, you know, a bit at a time, because I think that's the other part. I think, unfortunately, too, we're hardwired in some ways to we go, OK, I'm going to fix my mindset. And then you go, I'm going to fix it all, I'm going to fix it in one big fell swoop. It's going to be a big grand gesture, completely reorient, you know, reorganize my life around this. And that never works, obviously, for many reasons. But I like the idea of it. it's so small incremental changes that it's like the flywheel concept, isn't it? You know, the more you push a little bit, a little bit more, and eventually the momentum builds. Yes. And, you know, people talk only 1% of Americans stick to their New Year's resolution. And sure. it's too higher than I thought. <laughs> yeah, too much behavior change too fast equals mm -hmm. no change at all. And, you know, I, I began studying the brain on accident to help my son who, you know, struggles with mm -hmm. a, a lot of neurological challenges. And I learned that if we're not deliberate, our brain is actually working against us and, and we can mm -hmm. shift that. So the, the book talks about your mindset, which is the brain component, but then it talks about your skill set, which yeah. are a you know, boatload of tools that you can use to increase positive emotions, to navigate the stress relationship, to deal with the emotional intelligence component of develop a growth mindset. But then it's the reset, which is physically resetting your nervous system and mm -hmm. resetting your priorities and your perspective. Because let's face it, our resume and our eulogy should not be the same thing. <laughs> exactly. And I like also the fact that you also have like get to know your triggers, because I also think that's a really important one, because that's what derails us the most yeah. is these uh, unconscious or maybe we're even conscious about them triggers, but things that are set off. But until we recognize them and make sure that we know how to how to compensate for them, I mean, they continually undo us. And many of the and, and isn't it the sad fact that many of those triggers go back to seemingly almost innocuous things way back in the past in our child or whatever it is but until you recognize those things they can be such they can be so powerful in, in unraveling 
Absolutely. And most of us don't realize that we've got these old tapes playing in our mm -hmm. head. We think that our thoughts are facts. And so we say things as if it's completely true. Like, I'm just not a math person, right? right. We say things like that as if it's just a, a fact of the matter. The truth right. is I hated math, so I didn't work hard at it, right? But yeah. we, <laughs> we have these stories that we tell ourselves, and it's it's about changing the narrative, but you have to be aware you're stuck in it before you can change yeah. it. No, and I like that. I like that, you know, be more honest with ourselves, because I think that's good. It's like you say, yeah, oh, well, I was no good at math. I wasn't any good at math either. But to be honest, I wasn't any good. I hated it. So, yeah, I didn't exactly. try very hard at it. So um, that's the reality. That's the truth of it. If I'd have worked harder, probably it would have been okay at it. But I think that's a, I think that's another thing is like starting to be to be honest um, with yourself about the circumstances. Because I don't think it comes back to two is you have to realize the circumstances you're in today are the ones that you created, not that other people did. And if you want to change your situation, you have to change it. Well, I, I agree with you. I totally agree mm -hmm. with you. But I think that many people, so COVID, for example, has put a lot of people in a circumstance that they that, that they didn't choose, right? Like if you, if you own a restaurant and sure. it's now closed, right? But it still brings you to the same place, which is, yeah. what do I do now? Mm -hmm. Because trust me, I had a pity party for several years about why it wasn't fair that my friends sure. had healthy kids and I didn't, mm -hmm. or facial paralysis from my tumor right. and then fell down the flight of stairs before radiation. Like I told myself all kinds of stories and they might have been true, but the it goes back to the question, is it serving you? Is it getting you closer to the life you want? And if it's mm -hmm. not, it doesn't matter how you got in the circumstance. What matters is what you do to get out of it one micro moment at a time. Yeah, no, and I love that. No, and I do. I mean, I agree with you. Yes. I mean, there's a lot of the circumstances. It's more about how you perceive them and how you work work through them. And to be honest, it's the people who have the more dramatic circumstances are the ones who tend to do a better job at it. You look often at the people who have um Yes, a few minor inconveniences that seem to be holding them back in a way that people with major issues aren't being held back with. So sometimes I think we have to we have to question ourselves in that certain in that situation. Um, and, and I like as well as like uh, the, you say about, you know, be compassionate towards other people. But the, the thing before that is be compassionate towards yourself. And I do think that goes hand in hand because sometimes it sounds harsh. OK, to say, you know, oh, this is all, you know, you haven't this is all your own fault. And, you know, you got to get up. <laughs> but you also have to for, you also have to forgive yourself in many ways and be compassionate about, you know, maybe some of the things in the past that is holding you back. Just, you know, literally forgive yourself. Well, and especially right now, I mean, we're exhausted. It's like, mm -hmm. give yourself a hot minute. People are going, why mm -hmm. am I so stressed? Why am I not as productive? Yeah. Why am I not closing as many deals? Give yourself some grace. Nobody has survived a global pandemic like this mm -hmm. while working, while Zoom calling, while trying to homeschool children. Like we are so critical of ourselves. If, if your friend, let's say your friend missed a deal, right? Or you, and yeah. they said, yeah, I didn't close it. it. It just went south. You wouldn't be like, well, you're an idiot. What were you? <laughs> How could you mess that up? It was right there. I mean, but when we do it, we have that same dialogue with ourselves. And yeah. if you wouldn't say it to a friend, don't say it to yourself because you believe what you tell yourself and, and those thoughts become facts. And then we have confirmation mm -hmm. bias. So we go seek out all the evidence to support it. So one time somebody says, well, you didn't do great in that sales interview. Oh, see, I knew it. I'm just not. Yeah. Doing it. And, and we reinforce it. It, it really is powerful. Oh, it, that. it is. It is. And, and you touched another fascinating point there because we're fantastic at gathering these small pieces of evidence that will prove the negative, right? We're fantastic at that. We ignore all the big pieces of evidence that you know prove the positive. We completely blow blow past them. Yeah. But we're great at picking up those little threads and adding them together and saying, "See, it was I, I was no good." Yep, absolutely. And our beliefs become our reality. They drive our neurochemistry. Um, I'd love to tell you about the stress study, but I know we're we're short on time. But it, it's so powerful. The way you think about stress uh, is more important than the stress itself. Yeah, which is, and the one last thing I want to ask you is you have a you have a, a chapter called "Stop Searching for Your Passion." Explain that because you know the way a lot of people are always like, "Oh, you got to find your passion. Got to find your passion." Yeah, I was I, during my TED talk. I got to speak with Terry Traspasio, and she said, "You know, show me a window washer, and I'll bet you he doesn't have a passion for clean glass." Yeah. You know, we we tend to have this 
idea of finding our passion. And if we're not passionate every minute of every day, we feel like we're doing something wrong. And that's mm -hmm. part of the, the title, Mind Over Moment. It's yes. these subtle, tiny moments that you feel passion. Nobody feels passion in what they're doing all the time. I am grateful and beyond blessed to own my own business and help people yeah. and, and have a successful business with a team. That doesn't mean I'm passionate every single second, right? Instead of trying to find your passion, find what brings you joy. And mm -hmm. that turns into passion. Instead of focusing on your passion, learn a new skill. You don't mm -hmm. know what you don't know until you start to try it. And, and it yeah. just takes some of the pressure off, I think. And I think that's such an important point because especially, again, is it's a strange thing that's crept into our culture. It's like we're supposed to be happy all the time. It's like you're supposed to be happy in your job and smiling all the time or something's wrong, um, you know, then or your company isn't doing something and not doing enough for you because you're not happy all the time. Well, I guess that's... Uh, we're there's, not supposed there's... to be happy all the time, right? It's just an emotion yeah. like any others. We're, the Western culture is the one who's assigned this idea of mm. happiness your your brain is built to protect you not make you happy and so <laughs> it's it's about celebrating the happy moments and knowing that the other ones are going to pass yeah and and to your point it's like uh you know growing your business and 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 speaking on stage and writing your books right those are it's the outcomes that gives you the great pleasure and stuff and and but there are steps along that way that are just oh, yeah. hard work Hard work, and sometimes probably a lot of them things that you hate doing, but you do them anyway because it gets you to where you go. So this whole concept of of everything of being passionate all the time or being happy all the time is silly. It's it's you should be looking at the outcomes, you know, or or the overall journey to give you the pleasure. Yeah, and how you feel while you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't feel right, that doesn't mean it's not the right job. It means you haven't figured out how to maneuver in that job, right? I think sometimes. Mm -hmm. We try something for six months and go, oh, I'm not happy, and, and we <laughs> ditch it, whereas you need 18 months to really figure out if you're going to be a good fit for the culture, for the role. Sometimes you know sooner, but yeah. you got to give it some time. Yeah, but it's a great point. I mean, sometimes we have these ridiculously short time spans for, you know, figuring things out, you know, that, and, but if... But if you go take back a take a look back at your life, then you realize that things unfold a little bit longer time frames than that. And well, listen, is making meaning out of the tough stuff, right? So yeah. while you're going through it, it just sucks. But you look back with perspective. It's called post-traumatic growth. And it mm -hmm. means that we learn, we, we get strength through struggle. That's how we grow. That's what builds resilience. It's not built when everything is peachy and perfect. Yeah. And I think just the last comment, I think that sometimes if people would look back, um, I would say dwell on the past, but just look back and take inventory of the past, they realize how much more resilient that they really are and what they've overcome. Because I know some people who just, who will say, oh, well, you know, I've never really done anything or I've never had to overcome really much. And you go, well, let's let's talk about that. And when you go back, you think, well, what about this? What about that? And they're like, oh, I never thought about it like that. And the last thing I'll say about that is that struggle is not a competition. You know, mm -hmm. it, we all struggle at 100%. So people will say, well, my situation is nothing compared to yours. Right. We all struggle at 100%. Whatever you're going mm -hmm. through, whether it's a breakup or a mentally ill child, doesn't matter. You're still struggling at 100%. And it's giving yourself the grace to know that you will get through it, but that doesn't make it feel good while it's happening. Yeah, yeah. And if there's one thing for maybe any resolution for next year for everybody to keep it, stop comparing yourself. Seriously, we live in a ridiculously comparison culture and people are, it's getting worse. Stop comparing. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm big into martial arts, right? And one of the lessons I learned earlier in martial arts is like, there's always somebody bigger, faster, stronger, more flexible, whatever, doing it longer. It doesn't matter what. Your job is not to look at the person on your left or, or your right, it's to, it's to look at yourself yeah. and look at your own improvement, incremental improvement, getting back to your point, incremental improvement. And I wish if more people did that, we could get out of this crazy comparison world we live in. Yeah, are you a better version of yourself tomorrow yeah. than you were today? Exactly. And not good. You have another chance to practice. That's this whole thing about <laughs> yeah. life. It's just a continuous opportunity to practice. Yeah, this is fantastic. Anyway, so again, the book is called Mind Over Moment. Harness the Power of Resilience comes with the journal. Uh, I, and, I would, uh, and I would really recommend that uh, you know, people look at both because 
again, the power of a journal and the power of actually doing exercises with something reinforces or, or rather increases the, the chances of it sticking in it and uh, really becoming a lifestyle that is so much more better. Um, okay. Well, all of Anne's information will be below this, but before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Well, I would say if you'd like a resilient self-assessment and a self-care sheet, you can text the word STRENGTH to 22454. Uh, text STRENGTH to 22454. So I am providing training and professional development and keynotes virtually, not as much in person right now, but really mm -hmm. working with individuals, teams, leaders, and organizations to help build resilience, to cultivate a growth mindset, to get out of reactivity, and to just get through this difficult time with some inspiration, humor, and practical tools. Yeah, no, I love it. And and as I've said a number of times recently, you're never going to get a better chance than this, quite frankly, to invest in yourself. You might as well use it instead of when you feel those moments of thinking, oh, what am I going to binge watch on Netflix now? Maybe you want to say, well, maybe not. Maybe I want to read Dan's book. Or read it for five minutes and then binge. Yeah. It's yeah, not an all true. or nothing proposition. Give yourself permission yeah. to do a little of each. Exactly. And you never know, you might end up binge reading. So there you That's go. That's right. That's right. <laughs> all right. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. See you all for another interview soon. Thank you.